Welcome to Asteroid Day Live 2021 and the panel on keeping track of asteroids. I'm Lucy Green and together with my panel of guests we'll be talking about the latest work in this area. Now this year Asteroid Day Live is celebrating the 25th anniversary of the launch of the Near Shoemaker spacecraft which was the world's first dedicated asteroid mission. Now, a lot has changed in that quarter of a century. So back in 1996, the number of asteroids that we knew of was counted in the tens of thousands. Whereas last year, the International Astronomical Union's Minor Planet Center catalogued its one million asteroid. So how on earth do we keep track of all these objects? Well, to fill us in on what happens behind the scenes at the various space agencies, observatories and other organizations around the world, I'm joined by an expert panel that includes Marco Michelli, who is a near-Earth object observer at the European Space Agency, um, NEO CC, NEO Coordination Center. Laura Fagioli, who is a near-Earth object dynamicist, also at the same ESA Center. Lynn Jones, who is a performance scientist at the Vera C. Rubin Observatory, and Ed Liu, who is an astronaut and also executive, direct, executive director of the Asteroid Institute. Now, Marco, I'd like to start with you because a million asteroids sounds like an awful lot, um, but how many more do we think are out there waiting to be discovered? Well, there are, there are a lot. It depends a bit on how big you count something to still be an asteroid. But uh, you know, a million is a large number, but we have to think, first of all, that the vast majority of them, I would say 97, 98% of them, of those who we know, are in what we call the main belt. That is the, the belt of asteroids between uh, the or orbit of planet Mars and the or orbit of Jupiter. So they stay there. They are cool to study, but they are not exactly what we are mostly interested in. Uh, of those millions, so we have about 25,000 that we know of that are what we call near-Earth objects, NEOs. Those are the ones we care most about because they are the ones that can come close to the Earth, as the acronym itself says. Uh, how many of those uh, do we know? Well, 25,000. How many of those do we think exist? A lot, a lot. And it depends, again, on the size. If we limit ourselves to things bigger than about 30 meters, which is what is capable of causing some pretty serious damage if it falls on the Earth, then there are about a million of those. And we only know a few thousand of them. So there's still a lot to discover. Uh, of course, not all of them come close enough to actually pose a threat on the short term. But before we can actually evaluate if a specific object comes close enough to be a threat, we have to discover them. And that's why. Uh, the projects like the ones we're working in exist to keep track of them, discover them and monitor them. So I'd like to ask a bit more about then. So what kind of um, dedicated observatories or, or survey telescopes are being used to identify and track these objects? Yes, uh, there are basically two types of telescopes. The first one is what you mentioned, is the survey telescopes. And they are telescopes dedicated to discover an asteroid or astronomical objects in general. So they just scan the sky basically every night. They scan every part of the sky they can see. And they look for interesting things. In this particular case, they look for asteroids. They look for moving objects in the sky. Those survey telescopes then, when they detect something new, they check if it's new or if it's known, of course. They, they measure its position, what, they, what we call astrometry, that is the accurate measurement of where the object is in the sky. And then they report this position to the world so that other astronomers know they exist. Right now, there are a few operating surveys, and uh, most of them are in the US right now, funded mostly by NASA. Uh, ESA, the European Space Agency, is also in the process of building uh, its own survey telescope that will be installed in a few years in, in the south of Italy. After the discovery part is done, and the knowledge of a new object being in a particular direction of the sky is sent out to the world, then there are other telescopes dedicated to what we call the follow-up, which is the targeted observing of a new, newly discovered asteroid over the days and weeks and months and years after the discovery to make sure that we have the best possible data on the object and we don't lose the object, but we can actually monitor its motion in the sky. And again, other telescopes, typically slightly different, have this job to follow up. And the European Space Agency recently deployed two 56-centimeter fully robotic telescopes. 
um, as part of its space safety program. How did these robotic telescopes feed into the overall um, uh, work that's being done? Yeah, uh, as I briefly mentioned, ESA is in the process of building a survey telescope called the FlyEye, which will be a pretty large one meter telescope dedicated to discovering incoming objects, objects that are just about to come close to the earth and possibly hit us. And in preparation for this, of course, there is a lot of technological development, including you know, software and hardware and different things that have to be prepared. So ESA also built two smaller telescopes, 56 centimeters each, called the Tesla telescopes. And they put one of them in Spain, one of them in Chile. And the idea is to do two different things. The first one is to test all the software and hardware machinery that goes around building the future FlyEye. And the second is actually to actually start playing a survey and a follow-up in these in-house built uh, instruments with this instrument so that we can get the experience and get the confidence to be able to operate the fly eye when the fly eye is available so these of course are available earlier so we can already use them and we can already well, Marco, thank you very much for that introduction. That really sort of sets off our panel well. Um, but simply finding asteroids isn't enough. In order to not lose them, you have to calculate their orbits and, of course, keep track of them. And this is where Laura Fagioli comes in. So, Laura, welcome to the panel. Um, could you talk to us about what observations and data you need to calculate an asteroid's orbit so that you can then keep track of it? Okay, well, uh, astronomers, uh, uh, okay, actually we need uh, only observations. And uh, astronomers and uh, object observation, uh, that means uh, object position at certain times uh, to the minor planet center, which is uh, the, the center in charge to uh, collect uh, and disseminate those astronomic observation. And uh, what do what do we do with this uh, observation? Okay, um, well, we try to fit uh, an orbit. That means we try to fit to find an orbit which is compatible with observation we received from uh, astronomers. Uh, of course, uh, orbits we compute uh, are not precise. Uh, that means there is uh, always an uncertainty associated to that to to them. But every time astronomers produce new observations for uh, the same object, we have to recompute the orbit and thanks to this uh, new data the uncertainty decreases that uh, the orbit knowledge uh, in improves uh, therefore more observation we have uh, and arc uh, in which uh, we collect them uh, is long um, so astronomer observe the object at different times for a long time span more accurate will be the orbit so it is uh, the orbit determination process uh, is uh, an uh, iterative process Right, so it's not just a case of making some observations and then you've got all the information you need. No, I'm exactly. So I'm wondering how quick is that process then? Do you need to get observations over days or weeks or months or even years to be able to get an orbital determination that is sort of sufficient? Okay, uh, the first time we just need the uh, three observations. So we can have uh, observations from the same night. But as uh, I said before, if we have more observation in uh, a different time, so in a time span of days, weeks, uh, years, uh, is better because uh, in that way we can uh, uh, better know the, uh, the orbit. So we can better know where is uh, the object when we are interested in the, 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 this object. And then if you find an asteroid that is um, on an orbit that's going to bring it close to Earth, what, what happens then? With the, together with the orbit determination, we also compute the closer approaches with the Earth. And uh, of course, uh, the impact, impact monitoring uh, process uh, is triggered. What does it mean? Uh, we, we are uh, again uh, in the iterative process. So every time uh, we receive new observations and uh, uh, so that we can recompute the orbit, uh, we also compute the impact probability. What is uh, the impact probability? It's uh, the probability of the object to hit the Earth in the next 100 years. If that probability is not zero, the object is, uh, in, is included in the so-called risk list, which is uh, available at the NEOCC web portal. 
uh, of course, uh, it is fundamental to, form, to follow up uh, uh, the more important objects included uh, in uh, this risk list, typically to lowering uh, the, uh, their uh, impact probabilities or better to rule out them from the, from the risk list. So, okay, then when we know that uh, an object can uh, hit the earth, the, the first thing to, to do is to reobserve them. Once you've got your information about asteroids and they've been detected and you have got your impact probability, how do you then keep track of them after The ball goes back to the astronomers again in this case and to the people like me who not just keep track of surveys of discovery of new asteroids, but also of the follow-up. So the, the system that people like Laura operate they provide us uh, not just with the impact probabilities, as he said, but also with what we call an ephemeris, that is a position in the sky where the asteroid is. And uh, so we, again, iteratively, as Laura said, we point at this part of the sky where we think the object is. And when we reobserve it, we remeasure it, we send the data back again to people like Laura, who recompute and produce a new ephemeris, so a new location in the sky where the object is. And this process goes on, astronomers observing, mathematicians predicting the position and giving us the new prediction so we can find the asteroid again over and over. And we repeat the cycle of computing, observing, and so on over and over for many days, months, years, sometimes decades, until we either confirm that an impact is about to happen or we disprove all possibilities of impact. Brilliant. I mean, I'm really getting a sense of how interconnected the global community is. And I think now is a really good time to move on to our next panelist, our next guest. And um, because when it comes to detecting asteroids, we've been hearing about these different observatories around the world, sort of growing that picture. But there's one that I want to bring in, and that is the Vera Rubin Observatory. And Lynn, this is your expert area. So maybe you could just sort of, first of all, briefly tell us about this observatory and what it's designed to do. So the Verisi Ribbon Observatory is a six and a half meter telescope, diameter telescope, with a really large field of view. So it's 9.6 square degrees field of view. Um, this is a next generation survey telescope. The idea is we'll go with the telescope, survey the night sky, all of the, the sky that we can see, um, and do this every three nights, twice in, so that we do it two times a night and then come back every three nights or so. And just do that over and over again for 10 years. So this lets you build up a very deep image of the sky, which is nice for doing things like cosmology um, and measuring the shapes of galaxies, finding very faint stars, but it also lets you find all the transient objects um, so this includes stars that explode, but it also includes asteroids, which are moving so that this is how we can see that there are asteroids and we can track them by going back and observing the sky over and over again. We get to get many, many observations of all the asteroids. Um, and so we build up like this catalog of, uh, it will have probably about 5 million main belt asteroids. Um, somewhere between 100,000 and 250,000 near-Earth asteroids. And so there'll be all of these objects, including things from the outer parts of the solar system and comets. And from this, for each object, we get hundreds of observations. And so we not only can determine their orbits, but we can also do follow-up and figure out their colors, um, a little bit about their rotation properties. And, and so it's a really, really nice data set. That's really interesting to hear because I, I didn't really, prior to this conversation, associate the Vera C. Rubin Observatory with even solar system objects. So you're, you, I think you said you're aiming to, or you think 5 million asteroids might be discovered in this, in this data set and you'll be doing the science as well as providing information on the orbital um, um, movements as well. So do you think this data set will, has the potential to really be transformative in the area of um, asteroid research and asteroid tracking? Yes, I, I do. The, the nice thing about the data set from Verisi Rubin is that for almost all populations, we'll have between five to 10 times more objects than we currently know, right? So we know about a million asteroids now, 
after um, the Veracity Rubin, after we execute the legacy survey of space and time, the LSST, we will have 5 million asteroids in that catalog. And so you might say, well, 1 million, 5 million, what did that help? But it, it lets you do things like split them up into finer sets. So there's these resonances in the main belt of the asteroids. And at the edges of the resonance, um, it gets very complicated dynamically. And so by finding many, many more objects, we can really map out what those resonances look like. And we can also do things like see what happens to asteroids after they um, collide and then their fragments are drifting apart through space, uh, what we call these asteroid families, um, the collisional families. And so you can map out these collisional families to greater detail than we could before. Now, these are main belt asteroids, not so much the near Earth asteroids. For the near Earth asteroids, um, this is again sort of on the order of 10 times more objects. So you can do a lot more uh, detailed analysis of different subsets of the objects. Fantastic. It's so exciting to hear what's possible with this data set. And you know, it's making me think about the volume of data that we're going to have in the coming years. And so I think, Ed, this really sort of nicely brings us into your area as well, because when we have all this data, we need to make sense of it, we need to analyze it, and we need a new, potentially, I would think, a new generation of software in order to be able to do this. So the question I want to ask you is, when did you sort of first realize about the enormity of the challenge of coping with this new flood of data? When did that become something you've been thinking about? Well, we've known for years that the Vera Rubin Observatory is really going to revolutionize our knowledge of the near Earth asteroids, the asteroids that come close to the Earth. Uh, as Lynn mentioned, um, we are going to discover somewhere around 10 times as many near-Earth asteroids as we currently know. And you know, that process means that we are going to have at least, um, you know, for all of the asteroids which have a possibility of hitting the Earth, the ones that Laura mentioned, uh, when you calculate their orbits, that we know they're coming close to the Earth, we're going to be having 10 times more of those. So to give you an idea of what's going to happen here, we, we did look at just the discoveries in the first year of operation, and that's coming up in just two years. So when the Vera Rubin Observatory starts operations about two years from now, just in the first year, about, about three times a week, it's gonna discover an asteroid that actually has an orbit that if you look at Earth's orbit and the orbit of that asteroid, there is a possibility that they intersect. Now, three times a week is pretty often, okay? It's, it's, it's quite a change from the way we operate today. And most of those asteroids, obviously are not going to hit the earth, but the process that Laura and Marco mentioned of additional observations will rule those out. But for some period of time, there are a lot of asteroids which have a possibility of hitting the earth that we cannot rule out. Okay, So it's going to be a complicated situation here starting in just two years. So what we realize is that the one of the important things we really, really need to do is get ahead on this data processing front, because there are so many observations. Um, there, there's something like uh, a petabyte of data, I believe, per night coming out of uh, the uh, Vera Rubin Observatory. And then when you process all that down, that's a lot of computing power. And so we're attacking this problem from the computational side, from how do we make sense of all these observations and how do we best present this data in a way such that other observers uh, around the world can do follow-ups uh, so that uh, policymakers can look at these things and understand the importance of the various uh, observations. You know, I, I, when I say importance, I mean things that might hit the earth. And you've spearheaded the development of, um, I think, a piece of software called ADAM to help with this ana analysis. Could you tell us what ADAM stands for and um, what, what would the software do? Yeah, Atom is not really a piece of software. It's a software computing platform. What it is, is that it stands for Asteroid Decision and, and Mapping Platform. What it really is, is if you think of what Google Earth is or Google Maps, that's a platform that, that takes images, data, um, street level to satellite of the Earth and turns it into something that people can use easily, right? I, 
when I want to drive from my house to someplace else, I don't want to call up satellite images and, and request data from, from satellites and, and look for roadmaps from the U.S. Geological Survey. I just want to say, how do I get from here to there, right? And, and what it has done is revolutionized the way people uh, make sense of geographic data. Now, we're going to have a similar problem with the data of the solar system, the, the, the kind of data that's going to be coming out of uh, the Vera Rubin Observatory and other uh, large telescopes. And the question is, you know, most of the scientists actually want to get to the information in it, not to how do I get hold of this image or that, or how do I uh, bring in all the various sources of data? You just want a system that just sort of org helps you organize that. Uh, and that's really what we're building for, for space. So the software platform will be used by professional scientists. Have I understood that right? And, and um, when will it go online and be available? Well, it, it's being used internally right now within, uh, you know, we're, we're using it right now at the, uh, at the, with our collaboration at the Asteroid Institute together with the Vera Rubin Observatory. Um, we are beginning to open it up to other professional astronomers, but um, it's a development process and we really have um, two years, um, the, the clock is ticking until the observatory goes live. So we have a lot of work to do. Brilliant. Well, thank you very much, Ed. I mean, I think that was across the whole panel, just a really fantastic sort of overview of where we are, but also where we want to be. There's an enormous amount of work going on. Um, and it seems really that you know, asteroid detection and tracking is, is almost sort of moving on to being an industrial scale endeavor. So both exciting, but also slightly daunting as well with this three asteroids per week that could be um, near Earth objects. So thank you again to my panel. Absolutely fascinating to hear your thoughts. And uh, thank you so much for your time as well. Now, stay tuned to Asteroid Day Live. We've got a lot more coming up, including how we're getting to know the asteroids better than ever, how we're going to try and deflect an asteroid as a test, and what promise the asteroids may hold for our future exploration of the solar system. So don't go anywhere. And happy Asteroid Day. Bye.